All right, so we're going to be on page 109, page 109 in your workbooks, the power of the sacrament of the altar and how to receive this sacrament worthily. Man, you must have found the one pencil that has that sharpened in there last week. Oh, somebody must have come through and sharpened all of them. <laughs> all right, so um, let's read the two questions and their answers at the top. If somebody will read... That first part after, how can bodily eating and drinking do such great things? Somebody will read that, please. Certainly not just eating and drinking do, do these things, but the words written here, given and checked for you for the forgiveness of the sins. These words, along with the body, bodily eating and drinking, are the main things in the sacrament. However, believe, whoever believes these words has exactly... Thank you, Laura. Who receives this sacrament worthily? Fasting and bodily preparation are typically fine outward traits, but that person is truly worthy and well prepared who has faith in these words, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. But anyone who does not believe in these words or doubts them is unworthy and unprepared, for the words for you require all hearts of hearts to believe. That is correct. So this um, lesson, we're going to talk about sort of um, like we went through baptism. How does water do such great things? It's not just the water. What is it? The Holy Spirit, sure. But Peyton, I think you said it, or Connor? The Word. The, word. the words of God, the words of Jesus, combined with the water in baptism. And here, combined with the bread and the wine in the sacrament of the altar, in the Lord's Supper. Uh, and then we're going to talk about worthy reception of it. How to, um, when we receive the body and blood of the Lord through the bread and the wine, what makes us worthy, what makes us unworthy, and how do we um, deal with that? How, do, how does that work in our lives today? So let's go to 1 Corinthians 11. I had to restart my computer, so it's going to take me a minute to get there. Might just be faster this way. All right, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. And these are going to sound very similar. Remember, last week I asked all of you to memorize the words of institution, that you would have to memorize that. This is where we hear Paul give his account of the words of institution. So somebody will read verses 23 to 26. In the same way, also, we take the cup 
Cup after special experience. This cup is really something that can be read like you did are constantly dancing to the rhythm of this cup. Why often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the work of the Lord. All right. So these are the words of institution. This is uh, the words of Jesus that give the sacrament its power. Remember what, what things make up a sacrament? Visible element. Visible element. Forgiveness. Forgiveness, life, and salvation. That's what they give to us. Communion. What? Communion. Communion is a sacrament, but what makes it a sacrament? What's the third thing? There's one more thing. God's God's word. The words of Jesus, the command of Jesus to do this thing. So there are three parts to the sacrament. The, the word, the element, and the what we receive. The forgive, I can't make a three with my hand. And the, the forgiveness that we receive. The treasure. And that, that, that uh, forgiveness is the treasure. That's how we get eternal life. That's why we have this treasure right here. So in the one box on the, on the left, the words of Jesus make it a sacrament. The bread and the wine is the visible element. That makes it a sacrament. That goes in the other box on the right side. And then the treasure, underneath that you can write forgiveness and eternal life. So the Lord, we teach that the Lord has given us two sacraments, and maybe three. What are they? What are the two for sure, and then what's the third maybe? Baptism, Baptism communion, communion holy, absolution. holy absolution. That's the maybe third. That one's kind of debated. So we say like two and a half. He gave us two and a half sacraments. Why do you think he gave us so many things that all promise the same thing? What do they all promise? Forgiveness and life. Forgiveness and life. Why would God give us, why not just one? Well, we could. We could take just one. That's. I think you might be on the right track. No. We, uh, again? We do have a choice. We can choose whether or not to receive Holy Communion. We always sin. Yeah, you're on the right track right there. We're always sinning, so He's always giving. He gives us three different ways so that we have all kinds of, multiple, we have at least three different ways to receive, to remind ourselves, to be assured that we are forgiven, that we have that eternal life. It's a reminder that Jesus died for who? Yeah, for me. That Jesus died for me. So God gives you so many great gifts to remind you of that. He gives you that forgiveness over and over and over again so that you live in that constant state of knowledge thinking, I'm a sinner, but I'm forgiven. Remember, I think most of you are here, but raise your hand if you're a sinner. Right? Raise your hand if you're a saint. Everybody put your hands back up. That's right. You have been cleansed by Jesus' blood. You are holy in the sight of God because of Jesus. And that's delivered to you in baptism, it's delivered to you in holy absolution, and it's delivered to you in holy communion. God gives us so much because we need it. <laughs> We're constantly sinning and we constantly need the assurance that we've been forgiven and that Jesus is for me. 
All right, so at the bottom we have this uh, statement. I can understand that the power of the sacrament of the altar comes from God's living and active word and also how to properly prepare myself to receive the blessings of the sacrament. So we're going to flip the page over to page 110. And at the top we have confidence. Confidence means being able to trust in something or being sure that you won't or being sure that something won't fail you. Make a short list of three of the top things you're confident in and three things you're not confident in. Don't think, just write. So I want this table to come up with one thing that you're confident in, one thing that you're not, this table to come up with one, and then that table to come up with one of each. Something that you're confident in and something that you're not confident in. Just take a few minutes, take a couple minutes to discuss Does anybody still need time? Still need time? Okay. Y'all ready? All right, so let's talk about it. What's one thing that y'all are confident in here? Table one. Um, I'm just confident that no matter what, my mom always wants the best. Mom wants the best. Parents want the best for us, right? What is something that you're not confident in? Um, whenever my sister says that she will, quote, unquote, always be nice to me. <laughs> That's a good one. So you're confident in your... in the words, the actions of your parents and not so confident in the words and actions of your sibling. Yeah, okay. I can see that. Table two. Okay. In, in your own words, basically. <laughs> yeah, okay, I can see that. Table three. Okay. You're not confident in strangers. People you don't know, people you don't trust. I know saying that. <laughs> Do you have something different, Connor? Well, I was going to say, like, it's not okay. <laughs> like, it's not okay, sure. So a couple of you said that you have, of course, confidence in, in Jesus, right? And... In, in, in particular, I would say that Jesus' words, Jesus' promises, the promise of God, the promises of Jesus, uh, I think that's great. Others of you also said, you know, you're confident in your parents, right? That you trust what your parents are going to say and do for you. And that's interesting because what do we call God? Our Father, Our Father right. So even in our daily lives, though, I bet we can all think of a time or two that our parents 
kind of failed, right? I mean, I'm not, not to say anything bad about them, but our parents are human beings too, right? So sometimes all human beings are going to fail. They're going to sin. They're going to hurt us. Who's the one who never will? God. Jesus. The Holy Spirit. We can have absolute confidence in Him, even the way that we don't have confidence in others. Because there are people out there who don't have good parents. There are people out there who don't have good friends. There are people out there who don't have good siblings. So what do they put their confidence in? They don't have good parents. Maybe they don't know God. Themselves. Sometimes they put confidence... A lot of times people put confidence in themselves. And I think we do that too. Even as Christians, we put a lot of confidence in ourselves even more than we do in the promises of Jesus. I know there are times when my, in my life when I do. So we continue. There's a lot that in life that we can't be sure of. We can, though, be sure that of God's word. God's word makes things happen. Jesus said that the sacrament of the altar is his own body and blood given to us for forgiveness of sins. If God says it, you can be confident in it. Our Christian faith is a gift from God through the means of grace. When we take the sacrament of the altar, we do so in faith. What's the difference between receiving the sacrament of the altar in disbelief and receiving it with faith in God's promises? So let's open up our catechisms to page or to question 365. Question 365. It's on page 336. So I'll read the question if somebody will read the answer. Does everyone who eats and drinks the sacrament also receive forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation? That's right. So in the gray box here, what happens if you receive the sacrament of the altar with no faith in Jesus? We won't receive that treasure, yeah. All right, question 366. If I'll read the question, if somebody will read the answer. How then should we eat and drink the Lord's Supper? We should eat Christ's body and drink his blood constantly, believing that he was delivered for our offenses and raised for our justification. Trusting in his saving work, we receive his body and blood given to us under the bread and wine as a guarantee of our forgiveness. That's right. So what happens if you receive the sacrament of the altar with saving faith in Jesus? We receive his body and blood. We receive his body and blood, but what else? What is the... We are guaranteed. That's right. Forgiveness and life. Why do you think that Jesus gives us in the sacrament? So in the sacrament, we need a visible element, right? Why do you think that's important? 
the visible element portion of it. Let me ask you this. If I tell you I'm going to give you $100 and then I just walk away from you, what does that do for you? But if I just walk away from the $100? Oh, you're talking about the visible element part. Yeah. And then what's the difference if I say I'm going to give you $100 and then give you $100? Yeah, it helps us to believe. If you take that $100 from me, you are acting as if what I'm saying is true. And it is because I literally have $100 for you. Well, not literally because I didn't bring $100 for each of you today. Maybe next week. But if Jesus says, here's my body and my blood, and then he doesn't give us anything, what does that make Jesus? A liar. And is Jesus a liar? No. So he gives us a physical element. So that we can believe that what he's saying is true. We have the words of promise and the visible element. The two things together make the sacrament. And they're both important. Because they both work on us. The word and the element are both important. And taking it is an act of faith. And it strengthens our faith when we do it. All right, so the final question here on this page. What is one thing you've learned in this lesson so far about the place of the sacrament of the altar in your life as God's redeemed child? So what does the sacrament of the altar mean to you? Yeah? It means we're, we're living in faith. When we, when we act like we believe what Jesus is saying, we're living the way that Jesus wants us to. And it's not an act. I shouldn't have said act. But when we act according to his word, when we do what we're supposed to be doing, it shows, us, it, it shows our faith. It, it proclaims our faith to those around us. It's like in 1 Corinthians here, the verse 26. For as often as you drink this bread and uh, eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So when you take the sacrament of the altar, when you, when you go to the Lord's table and eat the Lord's supper, what you're saying is, I believe Jesus died for me. Are there any questions about that? All right, next page, 111. Why should we prepare for the sacrament of the altar? So far we've looked into what the sacrament of the altar is, what it gives, where it gets its power, and now let's look at exactly why we should examine ourselves when we're preparing to receive the sacrament. Read question 368, or the in that box right there, why should I care about preparing for the sacrament of the altar? Read question 368 and in your own words, answer these questions. Again, let's have each table answer both of those questions. So read question 368, then answer the question in that box right there. Is 
Does anybody still need time? All right. All right, everybody, is everybody ready? Still need a minute. All right, so table two. What do we actually receive in the sacrament of the altar? Forgiveness. What else? Body and blood. What else? Eternal life. What else? What's the visible element? There you go. Body and blood, wine and bread, forgiveness, life, and salvation. Did everybody hear that, boys at the back table? What do we receive? And? What's the other one? They said that. Well, life and salvation is forgiveness. Well, wine and bread. Wine and bread. We don't want to leave out the wine and the bread. It's body and blood and wine and bread. Remember last week we talked about in, with, and under? Does everybody remember that? Some of you weren't here, so... Go back and watch the video that I sent to your parents. But what does in mean? It's there. It's there. What does with mean? Together. Together. And what does under mean? Trust. We trust it that it's there. So we have the body and the blood in, with, and under the bread and wine. And when we receive those, when we receive that, we also receive forgiveness, life, salvation. So there are three things that we receive in the sacrament of the altar. What are the three things? One more time. Wine and bread. Body and blood. Forgiveness, life, and salvation. That's right. Wine, wine and bread, body and blood, forgiveness, life, and salvation. I mean, really, if you count them all up, that's like 15 things. But, you know, we're just going to say the one, two, three. All right. So that was, I started with y'all. So table three, what happens if we don't trust in God's promise when we receive the sacrament of the altar? Question 368. You could find an answer or at least a hint for the answer. Yeah, what happens if you if we don't trust? Yeah, it means we're unworthy. But so what do we what does the person who drinks it unworthily, eats and drinks unworthily in an in an unworthy way, what do they receive? Judgment. Judgment. That's right. They receive judgment when they eat it in an unworthy way. What do you think that means? Yeah. Yeah, so in the Bible, no, that's exactly right. In the Bible, we have Christ fulfilling, well, a bunch of roles, but in particular, for the purposes of this, he's a savior for those who believe and a judge against those who don't. And that's what we see in the sacrament. Those who believe that they're receiving the body and blood in, with, and under the bread and the wine, receive salvation. They receive the Savior, Jesus. Those who don't believe that receive the judge, 
Jesus. Which one do you want to be? The saved one, right? <laughs> the one who is saved by Jesus. All right, so let's go down to these blue questions right below that. Uh, each table, again, go ahead, take a few minutes, everybody, answer those questions. Who is worthy to receive the sacrament of the altar? And when is someone unprepared to receive the sacrament of the altar? You can find it in 367 and 369. Anybody need another minute? You ready? All right, ladies in the front. The first question there, who is worthy to receive the sacrament of the altar? Those who have faith in Christ. Those who have faith in Christ and his words given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. So what makes a person worthy to receive the body and blood? Faith. Faith makes you worthy. All right. When is someone unprepared to receive the sacrament of the altar? Uh, table two here. Yeah, when we don't believe. When we don't trust that what Christ says is true. When we don't trust that what Christ says, when we don't have faith, basically. When we doubt. When we doubt. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. We'll come back to that in a little bit. So receiving the sacrament of the altar is serious business. Jesus' true body and blood are given to us. If we don't receive it in true faith, then it actually can be a spiritual danger and not a spiritual treasure. So it's important to be prepared. Turn the page, page 112. So how do I prepare to receive the sacrament of the altar? The previous questions have really laid down the fact that we need to be prepared to receive the sacrament of the altar. It's a great gift. Jesus giving us his true body and blood for forgiveness of sins. If we don't believe this is true, or if we treat it like it's no big deal... The sacrament of the altar is disrespected, and we can eat and drink judgment on ourselves. So let's look into how we can prepare. Below are a series of questions on how we are to go about preparing ourselves. So again, everybody take a few minutes. Answer these questions, 370, 371, and 372. You'll notice that question 371 has an A, B, and a C. So in, the, in your catechism, there's also an A, B, and C. So fill something in for each of those. Um, just take a few minutes, fill that out, and then we'll talk.
All right, just a couple more minutes. All right, so that first column there. Do I need to physically prepare myself to receive the sacrament? Um, I don't remember which table I left off on. All right, guys in the back. Do I need to physically prepare myself to receive the sacrament? Yes, and why? Actually, you know what? Let's read. So in question 370, down there, there's a note at the bottom, at the bottom of page 339. It says, note. I'm going to read that. In Luther's day, the Roman Catholic Church required fasting before allowing someone to commune. This is not required in the Bible. However, although it is often associated with repentance and prayer. Uh, and I'll just leave it off right there. So, is it required? What does that note say? It is not required. But, should we do it? Yes. There's a lot of things in this life and in the church and everything that aren't required, but that we should do. Or even that we shouldn't do. So, like... Is it required that I eat healthy? No. Should I eat healthy? Why? Because it's good for you. So is it required that you prepare before you take the Lord's Supper? Let's, let's go back to the eating. Is it required that I eat healthy? Should I eat healthy? Why? Okay. Am I required to prepare before taking the Lord's Supper? No. Should I prepare before taking the Lord's Supper? Yes. Why? Because it's good for you. It's good for you to do that. Physically and mentally. It gets you in the right state of mind and it, it, it prepares your mind and body to receive the gifts that Christ has given to you. So the answer to the question here, just to be clear is no, it is not required, but it should be done. Does anybody have questions about that? Does that make sense? All right. So uh, the next box with the three boxes in it, we'll do box A right here. How do I examine my life as I prepare myself to receive the sacrament? You are aware of our sins and are sorry for them. That's right. So put that kind of in your own words. Um, become aware, uh, I just said become aware of our sins and apologize for them. Like, um, know that you've sinned and say sorry. Yeah. Basically repentance, right? And how do we examine, how, how do we, we talked about this, I know, a few weeks ago, so I don't remember if, I, I don't know if you'll all remember this, but when we are, how do we examine ourselves for sin? We confess, we confess but what do we confess? Yeah. Let me ask, how do you know that you've sinned? We, that's true, but... Remember, you look at where you are in life, right? Your vocation. Do you guys remember the talk about vocation? Your callings in life? Right now, what are you called as? Like, what, what do you, what are you? A Christian? A what else? A child? A what? 
a believer in Christ, that's a Christian. But you're a child, you're a student. A student. A what confirmand. a confirmand? Well, I'm I'm a daughter. A daughter? What about a friend? A sibling. So just you look at the relationships you have with the people in your life and you say, have I done this correctly? Right, Cason and Peyton? Have I been a good son? And if not, what do we do? We repent. We repent. That's how we prepare. That's one, one form of, of preparation for the sacrament. We examine ourselves and we repent. Right? So that's going to be letter A. Examine ourselves and repent. All right, and then what is letter B, table two right here? Yeah, so put that in your own words. What is it to believe in Jesus and in his words? To trust. To trust. We trust what Jesus says. And then letter C, table three. Resist the devil. There are a few things there. We intend what? That's right. So the important part of that is we intend to live as forgiven sinners. Put that in your own words. What does it mean to live as forgiven sinners? What does that look like? What? You're clean how? That's true. So what does that look like in your everyday life? Yes, that's right. I want it even simpler than that. You're getting real close. Even simpler than that. That's true, but to live in faith, to believe. All right, we'll stop playing. Guess what the guess what the vicar is thinking. Um, to act like a Christian. To just act like a Christian. To love your neighbor and to love God. So back before we talked about in the in the first one in the in letter A. What did we have there? Examine ourselves and repent. And then that leads to letter C. If we examine ourselves and see where we failed, now what do we do? We ask for forgiveness, but then but then what? We act like a Christian. Where we failed, what do we do now? What, is it, what does acting like a Christian mean? When you know you failed somewhere, you act like a Christian and do what? Confess. Repent. repent. But what does that look like if you failed at being a daughter? If you got into a fight with your mom and that was a failure on your part, what do you do next? You can say sorry, that's fine. But even more important than that, Yes, right there. Be better. Be better. Act like a Christian. Be better. That's what letter C is. 
act like a Christian, be better. Or do better. Does that mean that you will succeed at doing better every single time? No. no. But wouldn't it be nice if you just did better just one time? If you didn't, <laughs> it wouldn't be better. <laughs> if you did better, it wouldn't be better. But if you only did it once, isn't that better than not doing it at all? Yeah. yeah. And if you do it once, then you can do it a second time. And if you do it two times, you can do it three times. So you make small changes and be a better Christian, be a better daughter, be a better son, be a better brother, sister, niece, nephew, aunt, uncle, whatever your student, whatever your station is in life, just be better. Does anybody have questions about that? All right, so let's talk about these A, B, and C one more time. What do we have written down in A? That's right. Be aware of our sins and repent. Or examine ourselves and repent. I'm writing this down to make sure. This might be on the test. What do we have in B? Yeah. Believe in the Lord's word or just a one one simple one word answer for that. Believe in the Lord. Trust. Believe in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. One of those two answers will suffice. And then letter C. Strive to act like a Christian. There you go. Act like a Christian. Be better. Now, I want to reiterate that doing all of these things does not mean, um, how do I want to say this? Doing these things helps you um, in faith, okay? But this doesn't give you faith. Does that make sense? The reason that we do these things is because we have faith. Doing these things doesn't save us. What does? Believing. Believing. Having faith. Christ dying on the cross is what saves us. Being baptized. Having been baptized by Christ is what saves us. Receiving the sacrament of the altar saves us. Doing these things doesn't save us, but they are very good things to do. Does this all make sense? Kind of, sort of. Yeah? All right, then the last one. I don't remember which table we're on. Just Does anybody have a, an answer for the last one? Yeah, go ahead. That's right. So if you're struggling, if you're doubting, should you still take the sacrament of the altar? Yes. Yes. Why? To become closer to him, to strengthen our faith. What makes us, we answered this question maybe on the back page. Yeah, on page 111. What makes us worthy to have the sacrament? Faith makes us worthy. Even if we have a doubting faith, even if we're doubting a little bit, do we still have faith? Yes. That's right. Nothing that we do on our own, are we worthy to take the sacrament? This is a yes and a no sort of question. Because of Jesus, the answer is yes. Because of sin, the answer is no. So without Jesus, none of us are worthy. Does that make sense? But because we have faith and because of Jesus, we are now worthy to receive the sacrament of the altar. 
to receive Holy Communion. So, this last box right here. Summarize, if one or two of you could just give a, a quick answer. Summarize in your own words how you should prepare about receiving the sacrament of the altar. And don't worry about using just 15 words. What? What'd you say? Fantastic. Yes. That's right. These are your own words. So, does anybody else want to say anything? No? All right, that's fine. We can close up for the day if somebody would pray us out of here. Somebody not named Addison. Mm -hmm. All right. Amen. Thank you, Layla. Layla or Lila? Lila. Lila. Sorry. 